There has been so much awesome stuff going on. It is a beautiful spring day here in South Georgia. Uh, it's actually back to t-shirt and shorts weather. So like I said, normally I like to wear the nice button-up shirt so I look proper in front of the camera. Well, that, that crap is over right now because it's about to get warm. But as I have been promising, we are going to start continuing our line on making tongs. Uh, the past couple weeks, we've been teaching some weekend online classes that have been awesome. So I want you to understand that you guys uh, watching this video on YouTube are going to be the recipient of folks paying good money to refine a tong making class and you're going to get some good information here. So it's going to be awesome stuff. So guys, what I'm going to do today is I'm actually going to show you how to make a pair of flat jaw tongs. Now, a couple of caveats. Flat jaw tongs suck. They are about as useless as tits on a boar hog, simply because they don't hold anything well. If you've been out there even working with a pair of locking pliers and trying to make a knife or hold some flat bar, what happened? One missed strike, your work comes flying out the side of the tongs. Uh, it's a bad deal. However, for the purpose of showing you guys how to get your heads wrapped around how to make a pair of tongs, they're going to suffice for today. But please understand that this basic type of tong is just to show you about the boss and the jaws. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is we're going to be starting out with some three quarter inch by eight inch stock. Now I've taken some flack from several other smiths that say that three quarter inch is really too heavy for a beginner to start with. So here's the problem. You can make tongs out of thinner stock, but it's a pain in the butt. There's going to be a lot of work that you need to do, especially to get the reins drawn out. But I'm going to tell you, to be able to get a pair of tongs that I consider to be worth being in a professional shop, you're going to need the mass that's going to be in a three-quarter inch round bar. Okay, You've got a lot of stuff in there. You've got a lot of meat in there, and it fits the bill. So let me show you this. Because if you use the three-quarter inch, you're going to end up with a pair of tongs like this. This is actually the pair that we made over the weekend. Now, I haven't cleaned it up or straightened it up, but you can see that the jaws actually when they're done are three quarters of an inch wide. This is a reasonably proper pair of tongs. If you start with half inch, you're gonna have super narrow tongs. It's just really not enough beef there to do what you wanna do. So that's why I recommend this heavier steel and it is heavier steel. It's gonna be a lot of work. However, one of the other reasons that I do this is because back in the day, as I'm always uh, like to say, that steel came in three sizes, small, medium, and oh my God. One of the reasons that a lot of the older blacksmiths work looks differently from ours is because they were starting with much bigger steel and drawing things down. That means they were starting with plenty of material and drawing it down to what they need. It's difficult, nigh impossible, to start with stock that's too small and build it up where you need it just doesn't work so that's why we're going with the heavier steel you can do the same thing with half inch stock even 3 8 stock but you're going to have some weeny tongs there that aren't going to do you a lot of good now a couple things i'm also going to show you a couple of the different types of tools that can really help you out now if you've tried to make tongs before one thing that you might have done is that the boss, where it's where the rivet goes through, you may have hammered that joker super thin because it just looked wrong. And so you've got these handles, they're three-eighths of an inch thick, and these super thin, like eighth of an inch boss. Well, there's a couple things that can help you get around that. For example, these are both actually some of my power hammer tools. But if you'll notice, this particular one here, it actually has a stack. It has a 3 8 piece on the bottom with rounded edges and a 3 8 piece on the top. So guess what? The offsets for your boss, this not only gives you that edge to lay over the jaw and the boss, this piece up here kind of gives you a guide so that you don't get especially thin. Now, this is using the power hammer as a kiss block, so it guarantees a 3 8 inch thickness. You can use this on your anvil and kind of get the same effect. And I'm going to show you how to use that. Now, this guy is actually just a free tool. Same thing, 3 8 7 inch on the bottom, 3 8 inch kiss block. This is a little bit better for the power hammer because you've got two kiss blocks on either side. But this guy will do the same job. This makes life a whole lot easier when you're trying to make a pair of tongs. Okay? 
So let's get cracking. I'm going to get, again, this is three quarter inch round bar, just mild steel, eight inches long. I'm going to fire up and we're going to start working on the anvil. Now, before we get cranking, I want to show you this. Now, when we do this, I'm going to lay about an inch, inch and a quarter over this piece to actually make our jaw of our tongue. I'm going to lay it right here, and I'm going to strike some blows uh, to stretch this guy out and make that jaw. Now, you can do this as well over the edge of your anvil. However, the problem with that is it's, this is far more freehand, and you don't have a guide to stop you from getting too thin. So understand, you can do it on the anvil. It's just this makes it a little bit easier and gives you a handy guide. So let me grab our steel here. Lay it right there, and... I am going to keep it straight, keep it in line and square. Now again, look, I can actually accurately tell how thick I need to be. It is easy to thin it too much. And that can be the length of your jaw. Now you can actually make this a little bit longer if you just get a little bit more bite. everything straight and there you've got your jaw with no problem okay so again this could have been done over the edge of the anvil just like this but again two things here this is free-handed you really don't have a guide to tell you how thick it needs to be and because up under here it's not supported by the anvil this piece is going to have a tendency to bend so if you have this guy here it's not only the fact that you've got this little rise, it's the fact that the anvil face is acting as a supporting step as well. So it just makes a much more controllable piece. I'm clean that up just a little bit. Okay, now what we're going to do is we've got to make the boss. Now, again, this is where this comes in super handy. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave about a quarter inch of our jaw. And I'm going to make sure and turn this 90 degrees to the left. That's for me. It does not matter which way you go. But you must do the exact same thing to the other side of the tongue. So if you always go left, always go left. Pick a side. We'll let roll this up here. I will begin to flatten, and that's going to make our boss. Set on my piece. Again, I'm leaving about a quarter inch of the jaw on top of our piece. I'm going to rotate it to the left, counterclockwise, and now I'm going to set this down. Now, one thing I'm going to have to do here is I can actually make a little chink right there, so I'm actually going to spread this out because at this point, the entire rest of this bar needs to be three-eighths of an inch thick. But you can very clearly see that now we're getting something that looks like a boss. Now, you did see me actually turn this up and kind of have to give it a couple smacks this way because this guy's going to have a tendency to want to twist uh, just a little bit. So by coming in and making those corrective deals, I am keeping it in line. I'm going to take another heat and continue to draw this. Now, one thing you need to understand, and this is where a big mistake happens for most people that are just kind of getting into this, is that that boss doesn't look like a finished boss. It looks very small. It is. And then people say, well, that doesn't look like it's the right size. So what they do then is they keep flattening it until it spreads out. And by that time, the boss is super thin. So the mistake is 
what's going to happen is we're actually going to punch that and drift it, and then it's going to open up to be the full size. So just because your boss looks relatively small at this point, don't worry about it. The actual size of the boss is going to come from the punching and drifting thing that we're going to do later. If you keep hammering it to actually make it the right size, you're going to thin it out too much. One of the reasons that I've got the three-quarter lined up with the three-eighths is because everything's nice and neat. If I do half the thickness of three-quarter, that's the thickness of the boss. Half that thickness, that's the thickness of the jaw. Put them together, it's three-quarters of an inch wide, which is a good size for a tong. So that's where these numbers line up. And you have to think about the numbers and what's going to go where. Notice again how this is acting as a bit of a guide. I can very accurately judge how thick that piece is. Keep this square. And here's the other thing. Guess what? The height from the surface of the anvil to the top of that is three quarter, which is exactly the height that I want my jaw. So this little insert here just makes everything so much easier, keeping everything lined up and straight. Now I'll actually take the boss here, slide it forward, again over that edge and set it down. Now I'm out of heat here, but you can see that's going to be the back side of the boss. So let's, um, let's actually take another heat and we'll finish this up here. When you're making a pair of tongs, the front side of the tong is where you got to think. Because the way that metal's got to move parallel and perpendicular, that'll mess you up. That was always kind of an issue for me. I couldn't ever really wrap my brains about it. The reins just really are going to require a lot of elbow grease. It's that front of that jaw you got to think about and get right. Reins, just a lot of hard work. I'll set this over. And again, I can use my block to keep everything nice and corrected. Proper thickness. And that's where we're at. Now again, this looks a little too small. The boss doesn't look big enough. So a lot of people who are just using the anvil are going to get on that joker and they're just going to flatten it out and spread it till it looks like it's big enough. That's a problem because what's going to happen is this piece is going to be punched and drifted and it will open up to the size that we want. So we've got the jaw set out. Now a lot of this work here just needs to be for the tongs. The way I usually start this is that I will actually flatten the whole thing three-eighths of an inch thick. Again, notice we're keeping these same measurements. It's flattened and then it's tapered. Now with this amount of material, you can actually make these tongs a little bit longer than, uh, you know, like I said, there's a... Uh, even these guys right here that we did for the weekend, you can see that these kind of are relatively short, but there's plenty of meat here that this can be drawn on out. So it's just going to matter how much arm power that you've got. Now, when I'm doing these, normally this is, this is power hammer work. Again, this is three-quarter inch material. And as I've said in the past, anything over half inch is really sledgehammer work. So if you've got a buddy to help you out with this, you're going to do yourself a lot of favors if you'll go and get somebody with a bigger hammer and a little bit of extra elbow grease. But again, you just pull it out and taper it, and you should have, your, have half your tongue. But in the interest of time, I'm going to heat this guy up. We're going to go under the power hammer. I'm going to use the same jig that we used on the anvil and go ahead and draw the tongue out. You'll get a kick out of it.
That's right. I know I'm bathing in your envy. Power hammers are awesome. So here's what we have. Uh, you guys can see that we have what looks to be a relatively small boss, but we have nicely formed reins. Again, all three-eighths of an inch thick. We have our jaw formed. Everything is good to go. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to come in on the boss, and we're going to punch a hole that's about a quarter of an inch. Now, I have a half-inch drift, and I can punch a quarter of an inch hole and then drift it with the half-inch, and this bad boy is going to open up. So I'll take another heat. We'll go to our anvil, punch, and then drift. All right, we've got our thing here. We need to set this down. Make sure it's nice and firm there. I'm going to put my hole fast on here. And we're going to start our punch. Again, you want to get right in the middle, eyeball it. Now, this punch that I made is not factory, so it's not exactly perfectly round. So one of the things that I do to get around that issue is the fact that I move the position of the punch while I'm keeping it cool. That will help prevent it from getting stuck and halfway account for any errors in the lack of roundness. So I'm probably a little bit over halfway through right there. I'll take a heat uh, and then come back in and continue doing this. Also, when you're punching, especially on something that's a little thicker like this, putting a little bit of fresh coal dust in there will help prevent uh, your punch from sticking. Come back to the top of the anvil, goes back into place, a little pinch of coal dust, no problem. And that's nothing but water in that little cup, this is just to help keep the punch cool. Now you don't want to bottom this thing out, but I'm pretty good there, and now what I'm going to do is we're going to punch from the other side. And when you punch from the opposite side, you really want to do it at a darker heat. Now, notice what I'm doing here is I've actually got a 3 8 plate that I'm going to rest this on because if I didn't, it would bend this all out of shape. So I have a 3 8 plate as a spacer up under it. I come to the back side. And if you do this at a darker heat, what it does is it actually shears the plug as opposed to tearing it. Now, if there's any place it's going to stick, it's going to be right here. But, again, the coolness makes it want to break out as opposed to tearing. And if you do the job right, look at there, plug comes right out. And there is our hole. Now, let me point out, having a spacer makes all the difference in the world. If you don't have a spacer... You're going to be bending this joker up, and it's going to be a pain in the hind end to actually get this thing to do right without it just going to hell. So having the right spacers, and this is just one of my cutting plates and my punching plates that just gives me some support under that end. Now we've got half of our tongue. All we'll do now is we'll actually drift this bad boy. Now, going from half inch, uh, a quarter inch hole to a half inch drift in three eighths material, there's going to be some elbow grease involved. Now, I am going to go for the gusto and attempt to do this in one heat. But I'm telling you, I'm getting good heat and I am knocking the snot out of it. You don't have to go this fast. Just be able to take the drift in and out, keep it cool, work it through, and be patient. It's just a day. I'm going to be impatient. Now, real quick, I want to show you, this is the same mild steel half-inch drift we made in the previous video. This thing has actually been through two weekends of class, and uh, I'm still using it. Be great if it were a different steel, but it works pretty darn well for what it is. So again, as I've said before, you can use mild steel tooling uh, to do this well. We come over the top here. That fits in. Now, it's ready to go through, but what I'm going to do is with that drift in place, clean it up just a little bit, and now I'll knock it all the way through. Okay? We've got a little bit of deformity here, but that's okay. What I'll do is I'll take the edge of the anvil, straighten it up, 
And now what you really want to do is you want to come through this backside. But again, how do you do that without bending it up? Well, you have got to have another plate for it to rest on. Now, the issue here is that this plate doesn't really have a hole in the right place. So what I have to do is I'm going to have to span it a little bit. Again, not super ideal. Tuck it in. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, there is your drifted hole. Looking pretty darn good. And notice now, it's also kind of opened up into the size of boss that we're looking for. Pretty darn straight, too. Okay, let's take a look. So here is our jaw side. I mean, we're, we're good to go here. Now, of course, there's all types of little adjustments that we can end up making with this. We can offset things a little bit. But for right now, we're in a pretty darn good place. We can make all these adjustments a little bit later. So all we're going to need to do now is make the other side of this, which is going to be, and I stress, identical to the process that you just saw. We're going to do everything the same way, all the way down to when you get ready to do the boss, you turn it to the left. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with two halves of tongs that won't work together. They are going to be identical. So whatever you did for this one, you're going to do for the second one. So give me just a little bit. I'm actually going to come in, go ahead and make our other side of our jaws. And then we're going to assemble these bad boys. Here we have our two halves of the tongs. Now, there may be some adjustments you want to make with these and grinding, uh, especially right here on this little lip uh, between the boss and the actual jaw. Sometimes you need to give that just a little bit of relief with your grinding. Uh, it's not a bad idea to come in with your angle grinder, just clean that up to make that a flat mating surface. Uh, but again, when you put these things together and you kind of test fit them, you'll see where there's like super wear or things you need to adjust. You're just going to have to tinker with it. Now, you can go out and get a half-inch bolt and cut it to size and fit. Uh, what I normally do, just because I don't have... The, the best way to put a rivet through tongs is going to be an oxyacetylene torch. And since most of you don't have access to that, we're kind of going to do it the roughest way I know how. Uh, I have here a piece of half-inch round stock. Now, because our drift is slightly oversized, I can put this through here without it binding at all. It, like I said, it's, it, it's not sloppy, but it's loose, which is exactly what we want. Now, how long should this be? So the general rule of thumb for a rivet is that for the, uh, the material you want for the rivet head is the same thickness as the diameter of the rivet. So if this is a half inch rivet, then you want about a half inch of material sticking above the surface to turn into a head. So the thickness of these tongs when they're put together is ideally should be three quarters of an inch plus three eighths of an inch on either side means three quarter plus three quarter is an inch and a half. And that is what I have here, an inch and a half of half inch material. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to put your tongs together in the appropriate fashion. And that's when you figure out if you did them right. The rivet goes in and I'm going to set it again about halfway. If it doesn't fit up and everything's not neat and even, that's okay. We're, we're going to be able to take care of this momentarily. What we want to do is get sitting here just like this, and we're going to put this whole thing in the fire and bring it up to heat. Now, there is absolutely no doubt this is going to require a little finesse on your part to keep all these things together until you can get them tacked in. No doubt. Going to take a little bit of practice. The hammer you want to use for this is going to be a light ball peen, preferably under a pound. You can do it with flat-faced hammers, but you really want to use the ball on the ball peen. Now, notice I've got my little spacer plate here, and that's how I'm going to sink that in there. Now, you notice that we're kind of off. That's okay. Check this out. I'm going to hammer and tap to make sure the two bosses are seated, and then... I'm going to start working the outside edge of that rivet. I'm not killing it. I'm just slowly and easily working it down. 
Now, the spacer plate that I've got there is actually a half inch, so it's actually shortchanging this a little bit for some of the material. Again, not going to kill you, but I'm going to flip this guy over. And again, kind of working it, making sure everything's nice and loose. And I'll move basically side to side. Again, it's very important that you keep the bosses forced together. You don't want there to be a gap in there. And you're just basically going to sneak up on cinching it. If it starts binding, that's when you need to start working it. All right, so you can see we've still got plenty of looseness in here. I'm going to go back and take another heat. Now, remember what I said earlier that you might need to grind a little bit right there? You see where that's interfering? Now, I actually left that in there on purpose so because that's something that you're going to see and you need to make a point to come in there and clean that little sharp edge off. I'm going to do this with a grinder uh, and then I'm going to take another heat. Again as we do this sometimes helps to open these guys up and having a spacer plate can help keep everything even. See that's a little high. I got some other ones but we're just ah, we're just going to run it raw. I'm going to use the tried and true method here. Now what's happening is I'm going to work this down and I'm going to work it from both sides. And now there's some other specialty tools that you can make that actually help with this. But we're just going to take our time. Now the one thing you don't want to do, we see where it's binding there, right there. You don't want to lock this damn thing down so tight that you can't move it. You won't ever get it to move. So as soon as you start encountering resistance, work it. Now we've got a good rivet set all the way around. I'm going to clean that up just a little bit though. But boys and girls, right there, there is very little wiggle in there, but it moves freely. And that's where we want to be. Now sometimes you got to open that joker up a little bit and work it. And you do that while it's hot. You may have to straighten your reins a little bit. But there we go. We'll take another heat, and then we're going to come in and start cleaning up our jaws, and we'll size these for maybe maybe a little bit of half inch. I think we'll do some half inch. Now, before we actually go in size, you're looking at this, and this is all kind of wackadoo, right? It's okay. So you're going to have to make a lot of different adjustments, and you're going to hammer this whole thing into shape. If the jaws aren't aligned, you're going to tippy-tap to get them in line. It may cause things to loosen up a little bit. You may have to come back in and tighten that rivet. That's fine. If something starts binding, like it is right here, you can look and you can run a grinder down in there and clean up that binding. In this case, we're not going to need to. The point of this is the fact that you are going to run into all sorts of little straightening and alignment problems, and all you have to do is just tippy-tap them out of your way. So what I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to take another heat, and we're going to go over to the vise, and I'm going to show you how to size these for a particular stock, and that is super, super important. To size this, you're going to need your vise. This is going to be half-inch plate, and I'm going to grab it with the tongs, and you see right here it does not fit. That's okay. We're going to open up the vise, like so, and then we're going to clamp it down to the plate, forcing the jaws to match. And now that I've got the ability up here, I'm going to set my handles, just give them a squeeze, just so that, because this is actually how you set the handles as well. So you can just squeeze these guys up here until it's a good handful, and that's what you're looking for. So now when we take this guy out, check that out. Now we have pieces that are absolutely fit to the work we're doing. And that's the same way you resize them. So, guys, there we go. Now look here. There's all kind of things wrong with these tongs. Look at that. They're not even. They're not straight. It's okay. You're going to run into this same problem. If one side's too long, guess what? Grind that joker off. It's okay. 
you're not going to have industrial level results where every piece rolls off the assembly line being perfect. You're going to have to tweak and adjust. And one of the reasons I left a lot of these problems in these tongs, they're not even even on the back, is so that you understand the problems you're running into are common issues. There's going to be stuff that you're going to have to tweak and grind and adjust. Make it work. That's what you got to do. Make it work. But guys, there are your tongs. The only other thing that I tell you to do is make sure you even these guys up. And I normally put just a little bit of curl to the end so that when I'm using lock rings, they fit very easily and they don't slide off. So, but outside of that, that is a pair of flat jaw tongs. Now, Again, they are just about useless for most applications. You're going to be fighting these jokers all the time. Flat jaw tongs, in my personal opinion, almost universally need to be turned into box jaw tongs. So these are the actual tongs we did for one of our classes. You can see these are now box jaw tongs. And guess what? These tongs we made for the tong making class are now sized to actually hold the jaw so I can work more tongs. That's how this stuff works, man. One hand washes the other one. Well, folks, that is the tong making video. I hope you got something out of it. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. Please, if you have the opportunity, go by our Patreon page. The link's down in the description. If you want the fantastic blacksmithing book that I wrote, you can go to trentontie.com or make sure and follow us for checking out some cool live streams, all kind of awesome stuff. Hey, let me simplify. Awesome stuff, send some money. How about that? That's simple enough? Thank you guys very much for being here. You all be safe.